Hi, my name is Steve Crosby, Chairman of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Communities and citizens in southeastern Massachusetts, otherwise known as Region C, have begun to hear a great deal about a potential resort casino in or near their community. The purpose of this presentation is to provide communities and others with some of the key information about their rights relating to this process. We'll talk about what the licensing process means for communities that may host a gaming facility and for communities that are designated as surrounding communities. We hope this presentation will be a useful supplement to the tremendous amount of educational resources already available on the Commission's website, massgaming.com. In addition, communities and others with questions should contact our Ombudsman's Office, an office created by the Commission to promote an understanding of the Commission's licensing process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Ziemba, Ombudsman with the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. Casino developers have submitted to the Commission their RFA-1 application, or preliminary background application. We anticipate that in the coming months, they will submit their RFA-2, or site-specific application. The RFA-2 application deadline currently is no earlier than July 10th, 2015. This deadline is being reconsidered by the Commission. Let's talk a little bit about this two-phase process. During the first phase, the RFA-1 of the two-part application process, the Commission determines a gaming applicant's suitability to operate a gaming facility within the Commonwealth. Each of the applicants will be subject to extensive background investigations to ensure that they meet the high standards for good character, honesty, integrity, and financial suitability. Multiple investigative teams, led by the Massachusetts State Police, execute substantial background investigations. If a gaming applicant is deemed suitable by the Commission, the applicant is eligible to apply as part of the second phase of the licensing process or the RFA-2. The RFA-2 includes all of the detail necessary about the proposed project, including where it will be, studies on the potential impacts, host and surrounding community agreements, and any other agreements, for example, with the state lottery or the local entertainment venues. The Massachusetts Expanded Gaming Act is unique in how it provides rights for both host and surrounding communities relating to this process. But what do those terms mean? First, let's talk about the host community. That is the municipality where a casino applicant is proposing to locate a gaming establishment. An applicant must negotiate a host community agreement with the city or town where the facility will be built. Once that agreement is executed, the community's governing body will schedule a referendum, which must occur no sooner than 60 days, but no later than 90 days. This gives the community time to review the agreement and determine whether this is right for their community before heading to the polls. The referendum needs to be positive and must happen before an applicant submits their RFA-2 application. Now, let's talk about surrounding communities. The Expanded Gaming Act put a focus on mitigation of negative impacts of casinos, not just in the host community, but in the surrounding communities. Once a community is determined how it will be affected by a nearby casino, there are several ways it can be designated as a surrounding community. The community and the applicant can negotiate a surrounding community agreement and submit that as part of their RFA-2 application. Or, a licensed applicant can designate a community as a surrounding community, giving that community a chance to assent to that designation in writing. A surrounding community agreement will follow. If an applicant neither negotiates an agreement nor designates a community, that community can petition the Commission for Surrounding Community Status. This petition must be filed within 10 days of the RFA-2 application deadline. The Commission will make a decision on the petitions and will officially approve any designations included in the RFA-2 applications. If it finds that a community is a surrounding community, a surrounding community agreement must be submitted within 30 days of that decision. The Commission will update these dates in the near future and notify affected communities. Check back often on the calendar on the homepage of MassGaming.com for updates on deadlines and timelines. In addition to a surrounding community agreement, being designated as a surrounding community affords other important benefits, such as the ability to receive funds for impact studies and negotiating agreements from the gaming applicant, the right to receive notice of a hearing on the application, and the ability to participate in the hearing. 
consideration by the Commission of how the facility impacts such a community when the Commission awards the resort casino license and the right to participate in a committee advising the Commission about its community mitigation policies. The Commission will look at several factors in making a determination that a community is entitled to a surrounding community designation. Communities should take a look at the Commission's Regulation 205 CMR 125 that describes the type of impacts that could result in a determination of surrounding community status, including whether or not there is a shared border, a shared border is a factor but is not a requirement, the proximity to a host community and the proximity to the gaming facility. Impacts on a transportation infrastructure such as a significant increased volume of trips on local streets, changes of level of service at intersections, and impacts on state and federal roadways. Construction period impacts such as noise, environmental impacts, and construction vehicle impacts. Operation period impacts such as potential public safety impacts, regional water and sewer impacts, impacts on retail, entertainment, and service establishments, and increased social service needs. The regulation is not limited to these impacts. If the Commission does in fact designate a community as a surrounding community, the two sides have 30 days to reach a surrounding community agreement. If after 30 days there is no agreement, the two sides will go to arbitration, an arbiter will look at each side's best and final offer and create an arbiter's report. If the parties cannot come to an agreement, the arbiter's report becomes the surrounding community agreement. It's important to note that even if a community does not receive a surrounding community designation by any of the processes we have discussed, funding may still be available to mitigate impacts. 6.5% of the taxes on gross gaming revenue, as well as 10% of the $85 million license fee is distributed to a community mitigation fund. This allows us to take a look back each year at the unforeseen or the unforeseeable consequences of the gaming establishment. Particularly, we will look at transportation, water and sewer, education, housing, environmental issues, public safety, and any other issues that may arise as a consequence of the gaming establishment. Host communities, designated surrounding communities, and other communities facing an impact can apply to the Commission for use of the Community Mitigation Fund. The Commission will evaluate any applications for this fund after February 1st of every year. The first step for any community, host or surrounding, that may experience impacts from a nearby casino would be to figure out exactly what those impacts may be. This step can be a costly process. Communities should speak directly with gaming applicants to discuss any resource needs to evaluate impacts and negotiate an agreement. Assuming compliance with municipal finance law, an applicant can provide funds directly to communities who are seeking and negotiating agreements. Some communities may face timing and logistical issues in establishing an appropriation to use funds provided directly by a gaming applicant. So, the Commission has established a voluntary grant fund which can be a much quicker way to get funds to communities to determine impacts and negotiate agreements. If an applicant agrees to provide this funding, it can forward the funds to the Gaming Commission, which in turn grants such funds to the community. As funds are provided through a grant to communities, they do not require establishment of a local appropriation prior to use. The simple form for such voluntary disbursements is found right on the Commission's website. In addition to funding to an individual community, the Gaming Commission has also utilized the services of the state's regional planning agencies, including the Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development District, the Old Colony Planning Council, and the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. These and other regional planning agencies, or RPAs, have assisted potential surrounding communities with technical and advisory services. This service is voluntary. Applicants or potential surrounding communities have the option to use the RPA services. The funds for these services will be paid into escrow by the gaming license applicants and the money will be overseen by the commission. Any money left over after payments for work performed will be returned to the applicant. If, however, an applicant refuses to provide funding for technical assistance, a community can petition the commission for this money. The community would need to demonstrate that it will likely be designated as a surrounding community. Typically, the community can file a petition for an involuntary disbursement no earlier than 30 days after the host community agreement is reached. 
Please contact the Office of the Ombudsman if your community would like to get this process started. Or visit the Host and Surrounding Communities page on MassGaming.com for more information. There, you will also be able to find agreements executed in Regions A and B, as well as for the Slots Parlor License, which could act as valuable guidelines for negotiation of an agreement in your community. One more note that hosts and surrounding communities should be aware of when considering impacts. The Expanded Gaming Act allocates significant resources to research and problem gambling mitigation. When fully endowed, the Public Health Trust Fund will have 15 to 20 million dollars per year for services dedicated to addressing problems associated with gambling. The Commission is currently conducting a study to establish a baseline on numerous social and economic measures in the Commonwealth. We will specifically focus on the host and surrounding communities where casinos are planned. After casinos open, we will conduct a follow-up study so we have a clear picture of the effect of gaming before and after the arrival of these facilities. So with this information, we will be able to strategically plan and mitigate the negative impacts brought by gaming expansion. Massachusetts will be top in the nation in dedicating resources to this area. We hope this presentation has provided the basic framework of information that communities need as they begin to understand the licensing process. We encourage communities to avail themselves of the resources on the Commission's website and or to contact the Ombudsman's Office for further information. Please follow the latest updates on the Commission's website at MassGaming.com and you can follow us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to working with potential hosts and surrounding communities as this process unfolds.